So, for today's talk, we're very happy to welcome Dr. Julie Karekish from the University of Toronto. Um, she's from the Ontario Institute for Studies in Education. So, her research and teaching focus on language and power in conversational and intercultural institutional settings, particularly workplace ESL, which is second language, and in second language learning and teaching. So, her current project examine the acquisition of academic English skills by non-English dominant university students. Um, she also does uh, research on employment trajectories of internationally educated professionals and settlement and employment of immigrant and refugee learners of ESL, which is uh, the focus of today's talk. And um, she also does research on interlanguage pragmatics and supporting English learners through teacher education and changing linguistic landscape of Ontario's students. So, as a proponent of action research and other means of involving people outside of academia in her research, she strives to apply her research findings to real world problems through collaborations with professionals and learn learners in and beyond academia. So, without much further ado, I'll leave it up to Julie. Can I just get an idea? I've, I've met a few of you just now, uh, but those of you I haven't met, are you students in the graduate program in applied linguistics? Yeah. Okay. No. Uh, no. What, what is your background? I teach English as a second language at Sajab Zubhamaya in just downtown. Okay. Great. And the rest of you, the majority? I'm a student here. I'm studying TESOL um, bachelor's. Okay. Excellent. So we've got some undergrad, some grad, and some professors. And um, have any of you taken a course uh, or written about pragmatics? Do I not? Oh. <laughs> okay, so I can look to you two to help me out if I get lost, right? She was a teacher. I was just <laughs> okay, great. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. So uh, thank you for the introduction, John. Yes, I do really like applications of my work and so I will be sharing with you a collaboration today. Uh, it's a kind of a two-pronged collaboration, a collaboration with some colleagues in a settlement organization as well as collaboration between my students and me. And uh, so it's all about, uh, it's all having to do with the focus on pragmatics. So very Briefly, what I'll be covering today is some definitions of pragmatics and interlanguage pragmatics, and I'll describe this project, the collaboration, and after that, uh, kind of in a not very conventional way, rather than reporting findings from a study, I'm going to be sharing with you some of the general findings that we read about in literature and use some data from my project to exemplify some of those claims. So first of all, pragmatics is all about how we say what we mean and mean what we say. As an example, here's a simple statement, it's 510. Uh, this could mean you're late, or let's go, or why are you bothering me, or please leave, or we're late, or the time is 5 p.m. Uh, it could mean all of those things and a whole lot of other things. And it has to do very much with what the context is in which this is being said. Context depends on where we are. For example, we're waiting for the bus outside and it's minus 23 degrees versus inside a lecture room versus in a restaurant. It also has to do with who we're talking with, uh, whether it's a student, a colleague, our child, a parent, an employer, an employee, or a guest. All of those can also contribute to our understanding of the context and what we mean when we say what we say. Two factors that uh, very much play a role in the context and how we interpret what, what are being said are called power and solidarity. Uh, so let me try to describe those. Uh, one aspect of power and solidarity is distance. Distance has to do with how well we know the people we're communicating with, whether we're strangers, good friends, intimates, acquaintances, okay? The status differential between us and the people we're talking with also influences how we say what we say. Uh, whether we have the same status or one of us has a higher status, a perceived higher status than the other. Uh, finally, the 
what we are talking about and whether it is uh, potentially an imposition on the other person. So if I ask you to lend me a, an umbrella versus I ask you to lend me a thousand dollars, one of those could be perceived as having less of an, uh, be less imposing than the other. And those also uh, play into the context and how we choose to say what we say. So we all write emails every day and emails, uh, the, the very first thing you say in an email represents how difficult it is sometimes to weigh all these different factors, okay? I could write uh, an email to, uh, starting with hi prof, or hey Angelica, or dear Professor <laughs> Galante, and I meant to ask you how you pronounce your name. <coughs> Is it? Oh, Galante. Galante, okay. So uh, those also conjure up different contexts, okay? You might guess something about me, the sender of the email, on the basis of what I write here. And I know that many of you have wrapped your brains over how to address someone at some point or another in an email. So all of this is part of pragmatics. Uh, pragmatics is the study of what is said, by whom, to whom, and for what purpose. Or, as defined by Bill Castro, the study of speaker and hearer meaning created in their joint actions that include both linguistic and non-linguistic signals. Pragmatic competence is our ability to do that effectively. So my definition of pragmatic competence is how people use language in such a way as to achieve what they want, the ability to convey a message successfully, and for its meaning, whether direct or indirect, blatant or subtle, to be interpreted by the hearers as intended by the speakers. Uh, another definition of pragmatic competence is knowing what is culturally and contextually appropriate to say in a given situation. So this is something that all of us grapple with in any old language, okay? No matter how competent we are, how, how proficient we are, even if it's our dominant uh, native language or a language we're learning. But it gets even more complex when we're looking at language acquisition. So interlanguage pragmatics is the pragmatics or the pragmatic competence of a language learner. Interlanguage is an important word uh, for me because it indicates both the systematicity and the dynamism of uh, second language acquisition. So as someone, and by second language acquisition, I mean additional language acquisition, okay? Any language that's being acquired, uh, uh, researchers have shown that there's some systematicity there, that it's not arbitrary how we learn the rules of language, but we learn some of the rules of language in a predictable order. Uh, at the same time, the system within ourselves as language learners continues to change. It's dynamic as we acquire more and more of the language. So interlanguage pragmatics is our pragmatic competence at any given time in our acquisition of a language. Some sources of difficulty in acquiring pragmatic competence in an additional language are learning the rules of politeness, directness, appropriateness, and cro uh, understanding cross-cultural differences. Now there's a tremendous amount of overlap between these terms that I've just put up here. Politeness and directness, uh, very often we have to learn how to be indirect enough but not too indirect in order to uh, be polite, okay? And that's, that flows right into appropriateness. In order to be appropriate, we have to be polite, okay? And cross-cultural differences uh, show that what is considered polite or appropriate in one cultural context might not be considered polite or appropriate in another cultural context. That takes us to teaching pragmatics. Now, I know some of you are training to be or are already ESL teachers, and uh, pragmatics is an area that is getting more and more attention in terms of our awareness of what people need to learn as they're acquiring a language. Some of the things that pragmatics, uh, classes, uh, language classes might focus on are things in English such as modifications or softeners. So when you're asking for someone, for something, instead of just saying, uh, uh, lend me a thousand dollars, learning to say, well, I was wondering if you might have some extra cash and could lend me a thousand dollars. Or, um, would you mind? So these things are, some of them are formulaic, 
they're really hard. I'm sure you've experienced, uh, I'm sure everyone in this class has experienced learning another language at some point and, and grappling with how to put those nuances in that make what you say be perceived as appropriate. In the process of learning to, uh, of teaching pragmatics and learning to speak a language in a pragmatically competent way, uh, we come to recognize cultural differences, uh, understand sociocultural meanings, and learn how to build rapport and find common ground with our uh, interlocutors, with the people with whom we have conversations or interactions. Now, all of this is what I've been calling pragmatics. But there's a very important buzzword which is used in the world of employment, and that is soft skills. You'll find that it's really hard to, it's hard to get a clear definition of soft skills. As much as pragmatics is defined in academic literature, soft skills is not an academic term. It's a term used by real people in the real world, and uh, it's also because it's not written about very much in academic writing, it's not very clearly defined. Uh, nevertheless, it's really important. Uh, and in fact, this collaborative project that I want to talk about uh, got started because a friend and colleague of mine who works in a settlement organization uh, where they help uh, immigrants to be prepared to find employment in the greater Toronto area said to me, we offer a whole lot of language instruction, but we are not doing a good job at teaching them and the our students about soft skills. I want you to help me, would you help me, uh, to create a curriculum that would better address soft skills? And in order, order to do that, would you do some research on my uh, institution and find out what we are doing? What are we doing that's going well in terms of teaching soft skills, and what could we use help with? Uh, Okay, so before I tell you more about that, let me just say that uh, what it, I thought, I said, oh, yeah, that sounds interesting, sounds like a great project, I'd love to participate uh, in that and collaborate with you and my students on such a project. What are soft skills? So looking at websites, looking at how and where soft skills, the term is used, I came up with this list of things that soft skills refer, refers to. Uh, the adaptability and ability to problem solve, collaborate, resolve conflict, empathize, persuade, and negotiate. Sometimes the terms people skills or interpersonal skills are used interchangeably with soft skills. Okay, so I told you a little bit about my friend, whose pseudonym is Laura, who said to me, please collaborate with me on uh, creating some kind of a, a, helping us to improve our curriculum so that we can better address the soft skills necessary for the workplace for our future graduates or for uh, people who come out of our program. Uh, this settlement organization in the greater Toronto area, which I call Mesa Center, uh, offers a whole lot of different services including LINK, which is language instruction for newcomers to Canada. Uh, its counterpart in Quebec is the Francis Asseline, oh, is the Francis Asseline, um, and they also offer for more advanced uh, English speakers something called enhanced language training, which is sector specific, and Mesa Center offers uh, English uh, language training, enhanced language training in the areas of healthcare, information technology, office administration, and finance. So I said, all right, well, I'm in the process of creating a new course for my graduate students, and we've got some needs too. Uh, this is a course which is now called CTL 3100, Communication and Second Language Learning in the Workplace, and the students who take the course are mostly MED students. Uh, they don't have an opportunity to do much hands-on research. Their program is course, it, it's courses only, there's no thesis or uh, requirement for doing empirical research and it's actually quite difficult for them to get opportunities to do empirical research because of the ethics process which takes a long period of time and so there's not enough time for a student to write a paper for one class in one semester uh, and first apply for ethics and then go collect the data and then analyze the data. So I wanted to give students in this program an opportunity to collect some actual data and analyze it. 
Also, the majority of the MED students who were interested in this class were international, and as such, they didn't have the opportunity to work uh, outside of the university, and to experience uh, Canadian workplaces and language teaching, and yet the majority of those international students were going to be returning to their home countries and teaching English as a second language, so they wanted to see how it's done, what's going on in Canada. So. Long, the long and the short of it is that Laura and I, Laura is the manager at Mesa Center, said let's do an exchange. My students and I will create some empirical studies to investigate what's going on at your center and we'll share what we find with you. And, and Laura said to me, we want you specifically to ask research questions which will enable us to improve our offerings and soft skills. I think I just finished telling you about this. So let me move, move on to the next one. Uh, so uh, we came up with uh, the general question we wanted to answer was, what are the roles, perceptions, and implications of soft skills instruction in Mesa Center's LINK and ELT courses, and how can they be improved? Uh, now, then ensued a long process of Laura and me at interviewing all of my students and finding matches for them with what, depending on my students' backgrounds, professional backgrounds, educational backgrounds, language skills, what, what would be the best environments in which they could collect data and do observations. So we paired up my students, and uh, so there was one group of three, but other than that, pairs of my students were assigned to different, to work in different classes and or with different teachers who were at the settlement organization. And then, uh, with guidance from me, they created their research questions. My students created their research questions, and here are some samples. Okay, uh, one pair asked, how are workplace communication skills taught in language training courses for new immigrants? Another pair asked, how are soft skills taught to basic level link students? Okay, so they were, clearly from the question, they were gonna have the opportunity to observe the basic level link courses. Uh, another group asked, how it is the Enhanced Language Training Office Administration course preparing its learners for customer service in the Canadian workplace? And another asked, what are the gaps between learner and instructor needs and expectations of the program? All right, so uh, all of the students did some combination of classroom observations, interviews with instructors, interviews with students in the ESL courses, focus groups with staff and administrators, and curriculum and materials evaluation. Not all of them did all of this. Each group, each pair did some of these. Okay, now, um, rather than report to you my, all of my analysis of their findings, what I'd like to do is very briefly mention the learning outcomes of this project, uh, which are that the graduate students in my class came to develop their understanding of issues around workplace communication and got experience carrying out and writing up a, a, an empirical study. Uh, the manager of MESA, Laura, uh, received a report from my class uh, and then together she and I interpreted the report of the findings of, of my students. Uh, we provided feedback to her staff and Laura and I continue to this day to collaborate and she's now developing an online curriculum for their program and I'm trying to develop other ways of continuing the hands-on experiences, opportunities for my MN students. Uh, I very much appreciate uh, the work that my students did as well as the staff of Mesa Center and how we were able to collaborate and what I'd like to do now is also voice my thanks to my graduate assistant, Jean Sinclair, who came on board after all of this was over, uh, and I said, let's look at the data. Uh, let's try to do kind of a secondary analysis of the data and see what we find. Uh, she and I have since uh, written an article, a manuscript which is under review, and it's not so much an empirical study as it is a review of literature on ESO in the workplace and uh, 
then an examination of some of the data we have and whether those data support or refute some of the claims that are made in the literature. So that's what I want to spend the last bit of this presentation talking about. The, so there is a deficit orientation to literature on workplace ESL. Um, speakers of English as a second language in the workplace in North America. Uh, basically, uh, by deficit orientation, I mean that Canadian vocational ESL programs uh, take an assimilationist perspective. ESL speakers are doing something that's not adequate. They need to change their way of communicating in the workplace to conform to this so-called uh, kind of abstract notion of Canadian culture. Of course, any of us who live in Montreal know that there's not really such a thing as one culture, one workplace culture. And in fact, there's a lot of multilingualism uh, going on in workplaces. So one of the things that we would like to do, Jean and I and many of my colleagues, is try to get people to see that there's that it's really more of a myth than a reality that there's such a thing as a monocultural, one kind of Canadian workplace. Uh, nevertheless, what the literature shows is that employers, I'm quoting here, employers don't want to experience a sense of foreignness. Uh, so if an ESL speaker in the workplace appears or acts differently from whatever is expected, that's seen as a deficit. So they encourage immigrants to mold themselves into desirable workers for Canadian employers. Now, while Mesa Center uh, has been, is proactive about wanting to change and improve this kind of mindset, you'll see from some of the examples that they also buy into it to a certain degree. All right, so the first uh, theme that I want to address is how soft skills are defined in the literature. And um, I mentioned that it's not very well defined. Uh, and this, uh, the literature says, language teachers lack a consensus of what soft skills are. Vocational ESL textbooks uh, text pragmatics, uh, which is uh, depicted in vocational ESL textbooks, uh, is not usually based on empirical findings, but rather generalizations and uh, maybe anecdotal evidence about how people think things are supposed to be done. Uh, also, sometimes uh, prag the way pragmatics is addressed in textbooks is overly simplistic or prescriptive. Uh, some of the uh, literature refers to pragmatics being addressed, such as how to shake hands for an interview and make sure you brush your teeth before an interview and abstain from littering. And this doesn't go in, this is not very deep <laughs> pragmatics. Uh, so now, drawing on the data which we looked at coming from Mesa Center, we see that some of these same themes were substantiated uh, by what we found in the data. So first of all, we definitely saw a lot of difficulty among the staff uh, and manager in defining soft skills. They wanted us to look at how soft skills are taught, uh, but it was hard for them to define. Here's a quote. One person said that soft skills are about what is okay to ask in certain situations, body language, eye contact, what is considered to be polite in Canada, showing initiative. Now that can be broken down to a very, very basic level. And continuing, uh, someone said, you can't just say that from one to five, these are the soft skills. The more you go into it, the more personality traits you will come across. Be positive. Now, <laughs> you know you're new, you're nervous in the country, be positive. And uh, here's another example of how soft skills was defined by an instructor uh, in a, who was teaching a course called Work and Life. And the class in this, sorry, this isn't a definition from the constructor, in the instructor, but the class was doing a task and they were asked to critique an image of a prospective employee. So they looked at a picture of a prospective employee and then the instructor said, so there are more things that are wrong here. So what is important is posture. So when you sit, you need to sit straight, okay? When you stand, you should be like this, like that. So how you hold your body when you stand or sit, then clean your fingernails, cut your hair, clean your beard or mustache. Okay, there's one name for all these things. Do you know maybe they say grooming. Posture is how we hold our body when you stand or sit, how you cut your hair or fix your nails. Uh, this is a quote from a class uh, which 
pretty uh, well exemplifies one of the claims from the literature saying that sometimes the pragmatics and the soft skills are addressed at this kind of uh, superficial level. Here is another example from, uh, from that class, uh, a, uh, interaction between the instructor and the students. And here's what they, um, what, here's what they're aiming for. The instructor says, okay, look at this guy here. Can you see what is wrong? Can you see his hair is too long? The student says, too long hair, yeah. The instructor, and shoes, what about shoes here? <laughs> He's wearing sports shoes, sports shoes. Is it okay? No, no. The instructor, okay, so no. So you need more like classic, elegant. And the student says, gorgeous. The instructor says, no, gorgeous, normal. <laughs> All right, so again, normal, that's kind of open loaded term. <laughs> uh, what did we do with this as we were, uh, Jean and I were analyzing and looking at these quotes? What we decided might be useful is to come up with some suggestions uh, for things that could be done or, or how you could take this a little farther in future classes. Okay, so some alternative approaches would be to build critical awareness. Students could dialogue about the importance of context in, uh, in communicating. Soft skills can be taught through observation and a critique of authentic speech acts, such as job interviews. So instead of looking at some of these contrived interactions and pictures, they could look at real data. There's a lot of stuff available uh, from professors, but also even on YouTube, for example, so there's job interviews and things like that. They could maybe watch and discuss videos and bring them, uh, make them a little more realistic. Care must be taken to combine simplified language ne necessary in low-level language classes with a sensitivity to oversimplifying complex characterizations of people and their workplace behaviors. And that is not an easy task. That's uh, certainly challenging, but something we really need to take into consideration. I, I want to just introduce uh, one other theme that came up in the literature, uh, the notion of Canadian identity. Girard and Bauer argue that Canadian job-seeking immigrants are regulated by an institutional cultural capital that prioritizes certain qualities over others. Personality traits such as easygoing, motivated, and open-minded differ greatly in their interpretation across cultures. So within some cultures, these qualities might not be prized, and yet they are prescribed as important in so-called Canadian uh, job interviews. So, here is an activity in which the instructor says to the students, you're going to match words with definitions. They've got a handout. You can read the definition aloud, and the student who has the word that matches with the definition can say the word, can call out the word. Okay. So the student reads the first one, listens to others. The instructor listens to others. And the class is open-minded. Instructor, open-minded, yes. And the next one, responsible. Okay, responsible. And the student says, don't take a long break. Instructor, don't take, uh, huh, again? Don't take long breaks o work, uh, work overtime. Instructor, don't take long breaks and work overtime. In the class, hard worker, hard worker. Instructor, hard worker, hard worker, good. Student, winking and smiling at everyone. Instructor, winking and smiling at everyone, winking and smiling at everyone. In class, says, friendly. Instructor, friendly, friendly. So again, pretty simple uh, and we could argue something, some of these might really be interpreted differently depending on our context. Take the winking and smiling at everyone, uh, okay? So again, uh, how, could, how could we consider turning in this into a constructive uh, and a little bit less essentializing type of lesson? We'll get back to that in a moment, but what I want to show you first is another example from the data, and this was an interview with one of the instructors who talked about how she encouraged her students to create a Canadian persona. Um, she said, an internationally trained engineer who spoke English very well came from a very different culture, and it was very difficult to understand him and also to get his nonverbal communication skills anywhere close to a Canadian-ish then I told him that he really needs to think of himself as, as who he is, but who he is in Canada. So not a different person, but the Canadian version of himself. And he started to work on it, and we got to incredible results just after a few classes because he realized that it goes deep down to identity, that he really has to somehow figure out a Canadian identity for himself. So she created an assignment 
for students to create for themselves a Canadian persona. The student was to search for a celebrity to emulate so that he could build a Canadian identity based on that kind of a role model. And thus it was, as she explained, it was their homework to figure out who they were in this new culture. So it wasn't me prescribing anything. It was a bit of a journey and it was interesting. The results were good. From this, I would like to share with you some thoughts to consider. Uh, Canada encourages skilled people to migrate here, and uh, yet we teach soft skills and this notion that you have to fit in. Is there a way to do that without a deficiency orientation? Is there a way to do that without saying you have to acquire a Canadian persona? What is a Canadian persona? Aren't we all Canadians? So. What is the impact of such lessons on students and uh, ESL learners' identities? Culturally responsive, so there is quite a lot of new literature, uh, or not even all that new, but uh, there is literature which can help us to promote culturally, culturally responsive pedagogy and opportunities to explore people's identities in such a way which doesn't uh, require them to reject their identities. Uh, we need to critically consider how to present Canadian culture to newcomers and the, and the responsibility for um, understanding cultural differences is not only that of the newcomers, but we'd like to encourage members of the majority culture to accept shared responsibility for cultural and linguistic adaptation. So those are some of the thoughts that we came up with on the basis of that, and I wanted to allow time for you to share your thoughts and comments and questions. Yeah.